The topic today of this seminar is uh, pandemic, artificial intelligence, disruptive technologies and value creation. But uh, let me spend just two words about this seminar series and for those who are joining us for the first time also to spend two words about the Research Center. We launched three years ago and the, the Research Center is on artificial intelligence in value creation inside the AIM Institute at Amelio Business School. And uh, in this research center, uh, we are working with uh, several scholars so all around the world and also companies uh, that uh, are contributing uh, in discussing the different topics around uh, artificial intelligence. And the goal is uh, to see how artificial intelligence brings value, uh, business value, because it's our core uh, uh, competency at uh, Leon as a business school. But we look at also the impact on uh, the ethical value and societal value. And uh, with this uh, seminar series, which is one of the output of the activities uh, we are developing, uh, we try to discuss uh, with a key leader in the different topics, uh, how artificial intelligence and technologies uh, can change the way we live and the way we do the business. And the, in particular, the Research Center look at how artificial intelligence and uh, emerging technologies, today we'll focus on blockchain, disruptive technologies, affect the value interaction and uh, also business model. So how companies uh, uh, shape business ecosystem or a change are impacted in terms of business models. More specifically this year, and this is the, the purpose of this uh, webinar, uh, we are at the third edition of the web seminar series in value creation. We have already hosted two seminars in September and October, more focused on ethics for October. Today we have uh, Melanie Gilbert with us, but I remind also that we have other events scheduled uh, in December, even if it is not included here, there is a conference. Uh, we have also other webinar with uh, some professor from uh, MIT Sloan or from uh, INSEAD or uh, Germany University of Bamberg and uh, also in Lyon Business School uh, covering different topics uh, uh, related to the impact on artificial intelligence. It will be in a business uh, model, in network, uh, in smart products, uh, in sociology. Uh, so I really invite those who are interested to take note and to visit our website or follow on Twitter. More specifically, today we have uh, this topic, which is uh, strictly related to the situation we are living. Uh, so when uh, we created this calendar uh, in um, March, April, uh, so very early, we didn't expect that we were again in a lockdown situation, but uh, the topic today is perfect uh, for uh, the the situation we are living. And uh, we'll focus on uh, pandemic and uh, we'll see some uh, use case on how artificial intelligence, disruptive technologies and blockchain have created value. In particular, I'm very pleased uh, to introduce Melanie Gilbert. Uh, thanks, Melanie. We work uh, together on, uh, at Amelion also because she accepted to teach uh, one course this year. But uh, Melanie Gilbert uh, is also associate partner for uh, working with the public sector uh, in this, in working specifically with blockchain and disruptive technologies. In particular, she has uh, several experiences working with different situation and uh, public uh, um, sectors. In particular, she has assisted the Canadian federal government departments in better understanding what makes a good blockchain use case and uh, how to apply the right technology to the transformation journey. So that's why we have invited her because uh, I think her experience and also her uh, open mind, uh, her insights uh, could contribute a lot. And then I remind also Melanie Gilbert, uh, she's teaching at Amelion, but she's also guest lecturer at Carleton University. And also she has, uh, she's uh, frequently solicited uh, as a public speaker. So thanks, uh, Melanie, for this opportunity. I stopped sharing so you can share your screen. Wow, and it's wonderful. a very honor, a big honor to have you with us. It's an honor for me to be uh, invited to this esteemed um, series and uh, really, really appreciate the, the invitation. And I'm looking forward to presenting to you this morning. So if you just have a little patience with me, I'm going to get my slides up and there we go. Okay. 
Okay, just a second here. Perfect, we can see your yeah. slides. And, all right, are you able to see my slide? Perfect. The floor is to you. Excellent. So welcome everybody and thank you so much for that amazing invitation and introduction, uh, Margarita. You know, I, as you were mentioning, Earlier this year, when uh, you gave me this, uh, this Jennifer, generous invitation, um, you know, I thought about what topic we could talk about, even though you said it, it's months later. Um, but I, I really wanted to take the time to discuss about um, how disruptive technologies such as AI and, and uh, blockchain and other kinds of disruptive technologies are affecting us during this pandemic. And the reason I wanted to talk about um, these technologies during the pandemic is because, you know, it's something that's real. It's not theoretical. It's not something that happened in the distant past. It's not something that's happening in the future. You know, we're all living it uh, to the point where, you know, even me speaking with you today is in large part because of the pandemic. I hope Mark, you don't mind me sharing the story. But, you know, when I was invited to, um, to start teaching at M. Lyon, uh, you know, it was in large part because of the pandemic, there was a course that was supposed to be taught in Shanghai. And, you know, they were in the very first wave of this pandemic. And when the pandemic hit, um, you know, you reached out to me and you said, you know, you know, we're looking at potentially teaching this in Montreal. Now I'm, as uh, Margaret mentioned, I'm located in Ottawa, which is the nation's capital here in Canada. I am an associate partner with IBM. I've been uh, you know, uh, serving my clients within the federal sector for like over 20 years. And Montreal is about two hours away. And I thought, this is perfect. You know, I will, I'm so excited. It's like when somebody comes to your home and you're excited about showing off your house, everyone's going to come to uh, to Canada. And I was, I was so excited. And then it just, obviously everyone knows that it went like wildfire. And, uh, and then I was asked to teach these classes remotely. And I have to say, Emily as a school is a great example of how an organization can pivot so quickly and so well. And I, the, the courses went so incredibly well that the, the students, I feel they really participated. I got to meet some amazing, incredible people. So anyways, I thought this is just the perfect topic for today. Um, I just wanted to mention as well, uh, you know, I'm not a developer, I'm not a technical coder, I'm going to talk a lot about artificial intelligence and a little bit about blockchain, I think the value as Morgan was mentioned is that um, I work with clients on a day to day basis and so I'm going to share a little bit about my anecdotal experience with my clients and how they pivoted during the pandemic. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the, the overall impact. So the, the presentation has three parts. Uh, the first part, we're gonna talk about the impact of COVID-19 on digital transformation on industries worldwide. So what was the impact? You know, how did this affect companies? How did this affect the markets? Um, the second part of the presentation, we're gonna talk about how artificial intelligence and disruptive technologies helped industry during the pandemic. So what were the things about AI that really uh, helped certain companies transition? I'm also gonna talk about some of the challenges um, and, and some of the things that took to, to look for. And then uh, the last part of this presentation will really focus on the impact on business models. So where, and then where the opportunities are moving forward. So we'll start with the first section on what was the impact of COVID-19 on digital transformation? Well, let's just say digital transformation was happening well before the pandemic uh, and no industry is Im immune to digital change, right? So the, 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 the difference is that since the pandemic, organizations really no longer have the luxury of um, taking their time, right? They no longer have the luxury of uh, doing a lot of pilots and trying things out because when you're in crisis mode, you are trying to pivot and you're more in react versus proact, be pro being proactive. Um, and the, the pandemic has also created a lot of have and have nots. So we're going to talk a little bit about the K model. So what are some of the tech, the, the sectors that were already being disrupted? So we're looking at even prior to the pandemic, the newspapers, magazines, books, music, video, like we all know this, right? But artificial intelligence, it's, it's so interesting. It, it actually applies, for instance, Microsoft replaced journalists with 
artificial intelligence software over the summertime. They laid off dozens of reporters. Uh, in fact, um, you know, what they've done is they have replaced them with artificial intelligence software that can automatically select news stories and compose headlines. So Microsoft has been using AI to scan content, right? And then process and filter it and even suggest photos for human editors. So they actually laid off about 50 journalists in the US and approximately 27 in the UK. And that was just in July. Um, Netflix and Amazon are also having issues. They've been like, obviously when we talk about, you know, industries that have been, oh, sorry, industry that has been disrupted. Um, Amazon, oh shoot, I have the chat in here. Sorry about that guys. Let's get that away. Um, so Amazon and uh, Netflix, for instance, have replaced Blockbuster. That's that's that was something that was happening way way years ago. But even Netflix and and Amazon are having issues during this pandemic because of their um, content production. So they're actually facing challenges with their backlog and creating content because of the uh, the pandemic. Retail obviously huge impact uh, through the pandemic. So. Uh, from March to April, a great example of this is Primark. Primark doesn't really exist much here in, in, in North America, but they're very big in the UK. Um, they actually, from March to April, they went from generating 650 million pounds per month to zero because they had no online presence. So they were not able to pivot quickly enough. And even though since then they've, you know, they've come online, um, they have a bit of an online presence, stores are starting to reopen in some areas, uh, they're still announcing losses over 67% of profit due to COVID. And they're now in a new market. So prior to that, they had zero online presence, zero, right? When, if you go from one month to the next um, and you lose all revenue, uh, basically you had zero online presence. And so now they're competing with the Amazons. They're competing with you know digital native organizations, um, organizations or, or industries that are being disruptive today. You know the financial services, telecommunications, government, um, transportation. Government is a very special case. This is where I have a bit of expertise, and I'll talk a little bit about the difference between government and private sector in the pandemic. This is a big difference, um, and then agriculture and healthcare. And as Margaret was was mentioning at the beginning of the session, I'm not going to talk about uh, AI applied to healthcare the, or or how like or the pandemic and and tracking COVID itself. It's more about how it's been affecting business and how our business is surviving, and 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 on the economy. So um, industries that are starting to be disruptive, and this is pre-pandemic again. So there's the manufacturing, insurance, utilities, and you see manufacturing. Right now, the pandemic hit that sector so hard with respect to supply chain, right? And we're gonna talk about supply chains and how that's been affected by the pandemic. Legal profession, um, artificial intelligence, and this is a conversation I had a couple um, years ago with uh, Justice Canada. And uh, there's a there's a real backlash now. I don't know so much today, but I know not that long ago um, there was a real pushback from the legal profession because there is a lot of uh, anxiety around artificial intelligence replacing their jobs. Right? There's a, they're they're a little bit afraid of automation. He was telling me that there was a conference in Ottawa, and the 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 lawyers that on mass were walking out. They just they were really. Um, uh, there's a the resistance to change there, but what the pandemic has done, which I think is very interesting, is that it has forced everyone to shift really quickly. So if you look at this chart, um, uh, this this is essentially only this is a, a data that reflects uh, the consumer spending in the United States. Now, this doesn't obviously represent all countries. I think Canada is a little bit different because the United States has a very open policy with respect to COVID. Um, they don't lock down quite as much as certain countries. But I think that the initial, you can sort of see the initial impact, right? And I mean, this is just in graphic telling you a story that we all know. I remember March 13th very well. That was the last day I was in the office when, because uh, I would say North America was in the phase two of the pandemic. China was phase one. And then there are some countries that were in phase three and we're going to see a, another chart on that. But, you know, when you look at the consumer spending, if you look at the baseline around 0% at the beginning, and then for within not even a week and a half, two weeks, 
it just dropped off like, um, like off a cliff. Right. And so that severely impacted businesses and they had to pivot incredibly quickly. Um, to the point where, and I, I love this meme. This was going around the internet months ago, but I feel like this is very valid. And I've shared this in my class as well. So who led the digital transformation of your company? Is it the CEO, the CTO, or COVID-19? And COVID-19 is the one that really pushed a lot of organizations to change, right? So it's not a big strategic uh, initiative that can take 10 years. COVID-19 has forced uh, companies to react incredibly quickly. So today, you know, time is not a luxury that leaders have anymore. Um, the whole pandemic upended business as usual, like for communities and corporations, which mount, you know, they all tr strive now, um, not only just to make sure that uh, employees and customers are safe when they are transacting with them, but also, you know, managing, you know, the wake of economic repercussions, community lockdowns, consumer fear, um, and continual uncertainty, right? So the decisions they make today in this pandemic is going to alter their business strategy and their business model for years to come. So let me talk to you a little bit about um, my clients. And this is very anecdotal, right? This is not scientific, <laughs> but I think it can still uh, have some value and it shows a little bit in terms of some examples of how uh, certain organizations were dealing with the pandemic. So first off, I want to talk about the difference between government and private sector. Uh, as I was mentioning, my, um, my clients are primarily in the Canadian federal government. And it was very interesting because they had a lot of pressures too within the pandemic, uh, especially the two organizations that received the most stress on their organization was a, um, a department called Employment Social Development Canada. And they're the department, and every country has one of these. So they're the department that is responsible for um, paying for unemployment insurance, uh, pension, maternity leave, all these things, right? And Canada Revenue Agency, which, which is the department that's responsible for tax collection. I like to call them the lungs of government. So one pulls in the money and the other one spends it, right? And what happened was that uh, during the pandemic, as you saw uh, from the slide before, when the drop off happened, everybody was, uh, I think we, I'll just go back really quickly. You can see right um, April 15th in the US. And I think it was, you know, somewhat similar here in Canada. That's when all of the uh, emergency measures were put in place, right? By many governments in terms of trying to support uh, an employment insurance. Uh, in Canada, we had something called the CERB, which was an emergency relief for workers who had lost their job, right? So they, um, uh, so it was interesting because people were calling in, they were calling into their call center. In fact, I think ESTC was receiving something like 360 calls per second, and it just crashed their systems. They couldn't, they couldn't handle it. Um, and they started toying with artificial intelligence for chatbots. Um, same thing with Global Affairs Canada. We have, so Global Affairs Canada is the diplomatic core for the federal government and they have missions and every country has one, right? So they have uh, missions around the world. They, Canada has over 178 missions around the world and they are also responsible for the safety of Canadians abroad. And so they also were flooded with calls because what happened was that during the pandemic, you had citizens that were stranded all over the world. They were trying to come home. And so what happened was that um, they were calling into the call center to find out, A, could they access any of the funds because uh, they were the government was uh, providing emergency relief funds to uh, citizens abroad to help them come back home. And then B, uh, the government was actually coordinating flights. And I know many countries were doing this, right? But they were coordinating flights to, to bring Canadians home because it was cheaper to just charter a plane and get people out of certain countries. So their system was crashing as well. So everybody was calling in to the call center. They're just not equipped to handle those kinds of volumes. And they started also looking at chatbot. They had some um, pilots going on already just internally, but nothing production ready. So they just weren't ready for this pivot. They weren't ready. 
unfortunately, government, I feel, is uh, behind private sector when it comes to adopting a lot of these uh, technologies. And the difference, I'd say, between government and private sector is that, and I'm talking about Canada because that's what I know, but there seem, I think there's a lot more labor capacity. So what they did is they threw people at the problem, right? They just threw bodies. Instead of technology, they just threw, okay, we're going to get out, everybody. You're coming into the call center and you're going to help field these calls, which I thought was very interesting. But Global Affairs Canada, we, I actually have a blockchain pilot going on with them right now to help with um, tracking and tracing um, uh, goods around the world. So well, I mentioned before, they have 170 emissions around the world. They ship everything from office furniture to highly, highly sensitive documents for the prime minister. And um, it was a black box. They, they, you know, when you think of the Amazon and you know exactly where your shipping container is, they're dealing with multi-million dollar shipping containers and they have a hard time. I mean, they do have systems, but they're very archaic to have visibility into where is that shipment? So you could send a diplomat overseas and then it's uh, it could happen. We're going to give you a range. It could be two weeks. It could be five months. You know, I'm not, I'm exaggerating. Right. But you know, there's a range of time that this can, can, can come to you. So we were finalizing the beginning of that pilot and around the end of uh, mid February, right before the pandemic hit Canada, the pandemic hit and the global logistics team basically told me, they said, we almost, I mean, they were, I couldn't believe that we wish we had this in place because they had to pivot so quickly to shipping office furniture and have you to shipping ventilators and masks. So they were, they were trying to repatriate uh, supplies to Canada from different uh, missions. And so they were that I felt so bad for that team. They were working around the clock. They were sleeping. They actually had beds and sleeping at the office, trying to figure out how to, to have that visibility into the supply chain which they just simply don't have. They were working with their, um, their freight forwarder uh, and, um, you know, with their, uh, you know, with their partner organizations, they did, a, they did a great job, but it's a lot of calling. Where's my shipment? Where are we at? Is it here? Is it here? Okay. You're not sure. Like, let's, let's try and figure it out. So this is where blockchain can have a massive impact. And we're going to talk a little bit about which technologies are, are, um, are contributing uh, and can help with uh, with these uh, uh, issues in the future. The challenge with blockchain today is that it is still very nascent in terms of its applicability. Um, and then the last organization I wanted to talk to you about in terms of um, my personal anecdote here is a Canada Post, which is also a client of mine. And they're what we call a crown corporation. So they're not, they're, they're part of the federal because they have a mandate to report into parliament, but they are also operating like a, a private sector company. So this is my insight into how private versus government works. So private sector, uh, Canada Post, they are responsible for delivering the mail to all Canadians as well as parcel delivery. And we were actually running an artificial intelligence uh, chatbot, an AI chatbot prior to Christmas. So like in Q4 of last year, and uh, they were looking at helping their call center and again, I think this is where, to, honestly, for the, the quick pivot, this is where artificial intelligence has become a, a huge um, boon for many companies. So they they deployed the, the pilot. It went really well. I think the initial pilot was for about 60, we call them FTEs or full-time equivalency. So, you know, equivalent of an employee, right? And they could never um, onboard and have them operational as quickly as these chatbots. Like if you were looking at call center agents, the cost of a call center agent is in the dollar range for per call versus fractions of pennies, right? For a, a chatbot. So the, the, the return on investment on an AI chatbot is very uh, obvious. It's an easy, it's an easy ROI. So we did this before Christmas and they loved it. It went really well. We went into production and then the pandemic hit. And they even said to us, like, thank goodness we have this up and running. And we did it for both Canada Post and Pure Later, uh, which are two organizations that uh, flow into Canada Post. And they they were um, they were saying that it actually made a huge impact because they told us it's like Christmas every day now. Like since the pandemic, it's like Christmas every day for parcel delivery. And they are actually have concerns in terms of being able to keep up with demand coming into Christmas now. But uh, but yeah, so so they actually. Uh, pivoted really quickly, used artificial intelligence chatbot, 
to be able to handle the massive amount of change that happened in March. And so that's, uh, th those are just some of the examples that I have. But what I've realized through all of these um, interactions with my clients and what I've read and, you know, from what I see, the business case is essential, right? And it's always been essential, but <clears throat> there's even less time for organizations to do pilots and they just don't have the luxury of doing pilots right now, right? Like they, they, you know, they can without a solid, solid business case. I'd say a few years ago, uh, there was something I used to call blockchain tourism where people would come and, yeah, I want to hear, I want to blockchainify my project. And they had no idea what it was, but it was sexy and they wanted to throw their name against it. And it was good for their career. It was good for the project. Same thing with artificial intelligence. I'm going to apply it to my project without really understanding what it could or, and, and the limitations, really the limitations of these tools, right? Whereas now I find that organizations really have to take into account um, <clears throat> what it is that, um, that, uh, that the, what they're actually, what problems are they actually solving? One of my clients said specifically to me, it's like someone poured rocket fuel all over my projects. So what COVID-19 did was it accelerated the adoption of digital, uh, technologies, right? So all of their projects just ended up, um, <clears throat> being completely accelerated. And I feel, and this has actually been, um, represented not just with my clients, which I've seen, but also throughout industry. So this is a, a survey that was done by the IBM Institute for Business Value. And um, what, they've, what they've done is they actually interviewed uh, CIOs from around the world in terms of the impact of COVID on their business. And what they said was that 59% uh, uh, and this, this, sorry, this study was conducted earlier this year. And the report shows that um, the pandemic has accelerated digital transformation by 50, 59% for these organizations. And six, but I think the second chart is actually more, or second um, graphics even more interesting. 66% say they have been able to complete initiatives that previously encountered resistance. Because I feel like, <clears throat> this is just my observation throughout the years, is that the technology is the easy part. The hard part is the, the change management piece, is the, the culture piece. It's the actually people adopting technology. That's the difficult part. And so what I think the pandemic has done is that it's proven to many organizations that they have no choice to change. That change was happening so rapidly, they had to adapt. Um, so for instance, um, you know, when we're looking at, uh, you know, different organizations, the culture shift, right? That was probably the biggest impact. So when we're looking at um, projects that maybe were in limbo, a great example is within government, uh, again, is um, this is not specific to AI, but it's just the whole work from home as an example. Years and years and years, uh, the public sector in Canada, anyways, they were uh, federal, they were pushing to have um, the, the ability to work from home. And there was a lot of pushback. No, we need people in the office. We need people in the office. Well, I think when people, when COVID hit and everyone had to pivot hundred percent, they saw that it was possible, right? The only thing that was stopping them from uh, accelerating the, that digital change was just people's resistance. And so by in removing that resistance and having that cultural shift, it's allowed many organizations to move forward with projects where they, there might have been um, some resistance or just a little hemming and hawing uh, in order to actually implement that project. So I think that's a huge number and I think it speaks to where companies are at today, okay? So, and, and to be fair, the culture shift is in part defensive, right? Because a lot of companies are trying to reduce their costs. If the revenue is not coming in and are being impacted, as you saw earlier, by the drop in consumer spending, the way to self-support themselves is by looking at the back office and saying, where can I cut costs to help me uh, stay alive, right? And to stay productive. So, so a lot of these digitization projects, sorry, digitization projects have to do with uh, efficiencies in the back office. So this is probably one of the most, I love this chart. This is one where I actually talked to, I was on a blockchain panel earlier this week for the government and I, I talked about this and they were in shock. So, because this is um, from McKinsey, uh, our McKinsey report that was published earlier this year or October. 
And it shows that across business areas, the largest leap in digitized in digitization is the share offerings in digital nature. So it shows the average um, adoption acceleration. And if you look at the first part of this chart, it says globally adoption acceleration has happened by seven years within organizations. Asia Pacific over 10 plus years, they're like very advanced, Europe seven years and then North America six years. But if you look at on average, right? seven years and when i mentioned this it was funny because i said well you know government's already a little bit behind if you think of the difference within the private sector they're all they're already accelerating at a, at, a, at a warp speed seven years is amazing in terms of being able to adopt these changes to their business right so across the sectors you know the results suggest that um <clears throat> let's be clear though it's not even across all different industries so this is a, an aggregation, it's an average. Different industries adopt digitization and acceleration in different ways, right? So um, <clears throat> like there's actually more of a difference in this report uh, when you're looking at um, sectors that are producing physical goods versus services. <clears throat> so, and, and even more so between um, that versus B2B or B2C companies, right? So respondents in consumer packaged goods and, and the automotive and assembly, for example, report relatively low levels of change because it's a more difficult to do, right? They can't um, change your supply chains overnight. This is something that's a lot more difficult. However, in industries that are more service oriented, um, they were able to pivot and able to adopt change at a much faster rate. So it's not even across all industries, um, but but it is so but but it has happened regardless i mean this this changes is, is this is essentially a huge acceleration um yeah and so perhaps more surprisingly in the speed up is um is the enhanced offering so across the regions the results suggest that in the seven year increase on average the rate at which companies are developing new products and services is also very interesting so once again, the grape is even leader uh, is even greater, like I said, uh, in Asia. And respondents also report a similar mix of types of digital products in their portfolios before and during the pandemic. So this finding suggests that during the crisis, companies have probably refocused their offerings rather than made huge leaps in product development. Right. So it's more of a, it's more in, innovation versus complete uh, new R and D development. So I'm sure many of you have heard about the K factor, right? So, uh, it, it, and I feel like it's, it, it really shows how um, this pandemic has really exasperated existing discrepancies in society. Uh, those who've actually increased their well being during the pandemic versus those who have suffered. And I feel like this also applies to business. So, those who have embraced technologies such as AI and cloud um, have significantly outperformed and are actually expected to continue to outperform those who have not pivoted quickly enough, who aren't able to be agile and, and, and change given that fast acceleration. So which technologies make, like, make the difference? We'll look in terms of you know, which ones are, are actually making an impact. Um, I found this chart to be incredibly interesting. So if you look at, this is the revenue delta that was measured between the first half of 2019 and the second and the first half of 2020. And on the left-hand side, we're looking at revenue growth, but also the high impact uh, to COVID-19 is on the left-hand side. And of course, no, no surprise, travel is way over there, over 40%, negative 40%, right? Um, versus on the right-hand side, we're looking at moderate impact and then limited impact and those that are in the higher growth. And if you can see, it's mostly in the services industries that have done really well. The ones that are impacted, I find the trend and anyone anyway, looking at this chart has to do with, um, well, obviously travel, but, uh, but those who are affected by supply chains, right? And who've been disrupted. So uh, telecommunications companies struggled to keep up with dramatically higher broadband demand. That was one challenge. That's one of the impacts on that industry. Oil and gas companies watch prices shrivel as automotives and airplanes sat idle. Uh, consumer packaged goods companies race to ramp up production of essentials such as hygiene projects. I don't know if it happened to you, but we did run out of toilet paper at one point. Um, the, the, the whole supply chains had to pivot, right? If you looked at the restaurant industry, 
um, versus the grocery industry. Earlier uh, in uh, this year, I had a, a special guest from a Shopify that spoke to my client, uh, my class, and we talked about how they had to help their clients quickly pivot because there were restaurant chains that had to start who started selling groceries. Um, and grocery store or supp restaurant supply um, uh, companies who had to pivot to a consumer market, like going overnight from a B2B to a B2C, B2C model, right? So there's a uh, massive amounts of change, change there. So tech savvy organizations, um, there was an analysis made on how they were outperforming their peers, those who've actually applied um, technology during the pandemic. So across 12 industries where technology acted as a performance differentiator, technology adoption leaders outperform the revenue growth of their peers by on average 6%. Okay. And there were some industries, like as I mentioned before, that had more of an impact versus others, right? So technology would affect such as artificial intelligence, um, such as retail, um, in, insurance, energy, environment, and utilities, um, you know, they were the industries with the most advanced organizations um, and had applied technology, which outperformed their peers by more than 10%. So this again was, uh, was done in, in, in that survey. So I'm going to take, we're now into the second part of the presentation. I know we're at 30 minutes, so I'm going to, I'm going to speed this up a little bit, but uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how AI and disruptive technologies helped industries during the pandemic. I'm first going to talk about the different technologies in their, um, their, their, their application. So this is specific to the banking industry and financial markets, but I thought this is really interesting. I, I wanted to just highlight the different types of technologies that can help with digital transformation. And, and I do feel like, and this is not uniform against all the industries, but I do feel like this is very representative of many industries in terms of how they applied it during the pandemic. So advanced analytics and cloud or differentiators and mobile is essential. We're gonna talk about that in a second. Blockchain, I do a lot with respect to blockchain, but because it's so nascent, um, there's a lot of potential and it's not to say that it's not going to have a huge impact and we're going to talk about that later, but it, it will. But right now during the pandemic, it was just such a nascent uh, technology and, a, and, and the challenge with blockchain is that it's not something you can implement by yourself alone. Blockchain, you need multiple um, stakeholders. You need to be able to coordinate Right. And that whole, again, it's not the technology, it's the, it's the coordination, the, it's the change, it's the partnerships that need to be created. That is not something that can be done overnight. So there was less of focus on blockchain uh, through the pandemic versus artificial intelligence, huge gains in AI. And I would suggest, especially around chatbots and just people trying to get access to information, access to services, right. And using AI from a consumer um, uh, and, and client facing uh, perspective. Um, of course, robotic process automation it co goes hand in hand with AI and helps. Uh, I like to say AI is kind of like the brain and the mouth and you know the and, and the head and RPA is like the arms and legs, right? It actually is able to automate a lot of what the chatbot can do in the front end. Okay, so uh, this I thought was incredibly interesting in terms of the technologies that demonstrated the largest economic impact across all industries. So the number one was mobile. And you'll see why <laughs> we were all stuck to our, our, our phones <laughs> throughout this pandemic and every single country will talk off. Oh, it's just my next slide. I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's mobile had a huge impact. AI number two. And the third was cloud and, and companies pivoting to a cloud model or a SaaS model or some sort of services model that was uh, more easily um, uh, accessible for their clients, right? So cloud data management, intelligent information, IOT are leading differentiating technologies that we saw in the, in the last slide, right? 42% um, of executives reported that intelligent automation reduced operating costs um, and 60% more outperforms uh, than others that used, you know, just uh, uh, that didn't use anything. AI is an important performance differentiator um, especially enabling more responsive and agile supply chains, because even though you're not creating a new supply chain, you can use AI to help um, better coordinate your supply chain. 
Uh, many organizations have priorities, greater use of data as a key area for building competitive advantage, right? So, you know, there is, um, there, I just think that this slide is very interesting in terms of really demonstrating which were the top ones that have affected industry. So as I mentioned before, this is from App Annie. They've got some really interesting data on um, mobile adoption. This is only Android, but I feel like this is very representative of the world. So if you look at this chart, uh, the red represents uh, the first phase of the pandemic. So China was in the very first phase, right? And their mobile overall, and you can see like the light bar is last year, the middle bar is the first half of 2020, and then the darker bar is where we are right now, which is in the second half of 2020 in terms of mobile usage. And so you can see that in China, the mobile usage went up like 15%. And actually I had another chart, but I, I took it out, but it was, um, it showed that between March or I think it was between March and February that the the difference for China was like 30%. Like there was a huge, and most, com most uh, countries experienced a massive spike between when the pandemic first hit, right? Cause everyone's more in that um, lockdown mode. So across the world, everybody has gone up in terms of their mobile usage. Um, it was interesting, four to five business apps um, by time spent in Q2, so right now, 2020, um, globally, or so not my Q2, uh, excluding China, were video conferencing apps, right? So what we're doing right now, so our Zoom. Um, and PayPal's mobile growth was a main contributor to earnings per share growth, 86% in Q2. And what's interesting is that, um, you know, there are certain organizations that really benefited from the pandemic versus others when we talk about that K model, right? So if you talk about Amazon and um, some of the really big vendors, uh, platform vendors versus the small uh, ones, uh, th there are a lot of the, the have and have nots. So if we look at AI specifically, uh, 9.5 to 15.5 U.S. trillion annual economic value prior to the pandemic. This is from 2008, right? And this was their analysis. This is from McKinsey um, that was looking at what is the market opportunity for artificial intelligence. Before we go any further, I just wanted to do a really quick, I'm sure everyone on this, this call knows what AI is, but I just wanted to really make a distinction between machine learning and deep learning um, just so that we understand uh, the difference. So I like this chart because it kind of shows Artificial intelligence is kind of like the the um, the topic, right? It's kind of like the, uh, the the area that we're talking about. Machine learning is very specific to um, algorithms that need to be uh, uh, tagged, right? So we actually have to use, um, uh, you know, uh, somebody has to actually train the models, uh, and that can be very time consuming. Deep learning is a, uh, and it uses uh, something called supervised learning, right? Versus deep learning is uh, an algorithmic approach. Um, it uses the, you know, the, the concept of neural networks and it requires large, vast amounts of data, right? And so the interesting thing about this is that, um, Okay, it's a build slide. So uh, th 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 there's opportunity for both, but the ch there's challenges and there's limitations for both as well. So when we talk about deep learning, um, you know, we're looking at algorithmic process, big data, as I mentioned, you need vast amounts of data for it to be effective and also computing power. There is, uh, it does tap out at a certain point, which is why in my class, when we talk about deep learning, the opportunity is really when we talk about quantum as an example and quantum being able to, um, really accelerate optimization models, for instance, um, using deep learning is going to be a huge uh, change maker in the next five years. So uh, these are all the different, um, you know, elements of deep learning. But the challenge with some of these models is that it requires data. <laughs> and the pandemic has disrupted this data, right? So um, there's a lack of disruption of historical data during COVID-19. So it, there's a lot of outliers. So how does that affect our models? Um, machine learning can take weeks or months to cleanse and train the data. So during a pandemic, you don't necessarily have weeks and months. Like I remember uh, recently I was uh, presenting to a, 
CDO, a chief data officer within one of the government departments about a use case that we did in the UK around using artificial intelligence for um, detecting port hopping, which is uh, fraud. So some uh, you know, mafia or whatever will or use uh, different ports and they'll, they'll send test um, uh, test samples, right? They'll hide them in bananas or they'll hide them in ceramic tiles and stuff to kind of uh, escape uh, inspection because you won't you don't ever want to open up a case of bananas because it'll ruin the product um, as soon as it as soon as auction gets into the package and ceramic tiles is great because the sensors can't get through because you so you can easily hide weapons as an example in ceramic tiles okay so we were doing this in the UK and um i was telling we were telling her about this 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 use case and she was saying you know what was very refreshing is that you guys acknowledge that 80 percent i'll, I'll just dip, uh, skip ahead and i'll skip back 80 percent of the work is just getting the the data ready for use right like that's the bulk of the work so if you're in a pandemic you don't have the luxury of time as i mentioned before so that was that's a big challenge for ai um Successful deployment of AI depends on org an organization's capabilities. And I'm gonna get to that in just a second. It depends where you are on the capability matrix within. Again, the technology is the easy part. How is your organization, um, where is your organization in that capability matrix in terms of being able to actually adopt AI, right? Um, and we're and I would say that we're still very much um, too far away from AI being able to provide business strategy recommendations, right? Um, so it's just, it, it, you know, it can't predict that the challenge with um, strategy is that it's not based on data. It's a, it is, but it's not. It's more, um, how should I say this? It, it, it's more, it's creative. It's more creative projections, right? So it's not something that AI can do easily at this point in time. So when I talk about the maturity on a graph, this is something that I talk to my students about. Again, it's not the technology that's the hard part, it's the organization and it's the, the change, right? So when you look at this capability matrix and where an organization might fall, most companies are still at the bottom middle to this chart, right? There are very few organizations who have adopted like a transformational and have really imbued AI into the very being of their company. Right, so there are, there's a many that are inactive and they're just looking at it now. Primark is an example, well, they're not doing AI, but like a company like Primark that even have a digital presence, right? Um, you know, they would all fall in the inactive phase um, all the way to experimental. Yeah, I'm gonna move forward because I could spend some time on the slide, but yes, so there's, so it, it really depends. The point of the slide is to say, it depends where your organization is at in order to be able to, um, to, to really deploy AI successfully. So uh, COVID-19 related disruptions, this is from McKinsey again, um, to an uh, analytics models are more common in industries where organizations really have more heavily, rely more heavily on advanced analytics. Um, so determining where to focus model assessments requires identifying new or newly important business strategies that, that the pandemic has. And I thought this was really interesting. Again, this is some, some of the industries that were really impacted by, by COVID, retail, telco banking, again, very similar to the other slide that I had shown before. Um, and it just shows the importance of advanced analytics. And this speaks again to the fact that any organization that was heavily relying on vast amounts of data and that were disrupted and can no longer use those same models were heavily impacted. So this is the difference between this slide and the slide that I had uh, provided before. These are organizations or, or, or industries that were already applying AR or advanced analytics, but can no longer rely on their old business models because of the outliers. That being said, what are some of the opportunities uh, of applying AI to business, right? So um, for small companies, an example, the disruption of data sets helps level the playing field because many small, many organizations don't have vast, vast amounts of data or access to vast amounts of data. So it does sort of level the playing field for some organizations. Uh, another, um, area that's kind of come up is scenario analysis has become increasingly adopted um, since it learns from 
simulated experience versus large data sets. So a combination of machine learning and scenario-based analysis is providing really promising results for some organizations. So there's an opportunity to maybe pivot in terms of the types of AI, AI models that companies are using um, during the pandemic and, and moving forward, right? Um, okay. So again, here's some examples of applied key business challenges during COVID for AI. Um, so variation in customer demand and availability of supply. So again, we're looking at supply chain. So real-time forecasting for decision-making. Uh, supply chain disruptions. AI can help with the uh, flexible resource allocation and cost efficiencies. Security. Um, the ability to monitor and detect security threats and respond to incidents. So using it for uh, fraud detection as an example. Um, contingency planning, so predictive analytics and forecasting for decision making, uh, workforce allocation and retention, we're going to talk about this in just a minute, um, labor allocation analytics, so being able to deploy your workforce, especially during a pandemic, can be incredibly uh, important, especially for manufacturing, and, and advanced uh, personalized training and support. So, for instance, trying to figure out, you know, shifts on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a line, you know what I mean, on a production line. Um, and then customer engagement, real-time product customization uh, for your clients. So now we're in the last phase of this uh, presentation. What is the impact on business models? I find that there's two main drivers to digi uh, digitization. So one, it's the back office, right? When, as I mentioned before, a lot that is driving uh, change in digitization is the uh, push to gain efficiencies from the back office. So, you know, blockchain is a really good example of that. In some ways, you're able to look back and um, see how you can improve your um, your workflows, right? And then there's the and then there's the opportunity, right? The opportunity which is customer facing to gain competitive market share. So you've got like the back office, and then you got your front, right? And then the front is also what new business models and new what new services can you create out of this um, digitization or this uh, the modernization. So I say there's three main areas that business models were accelerated by COVID. Workforce management and customer engagement, uh, platform economy and subscription services, uh, and supply chains and intelligent workflow. So when we talk about workforce management, as I mentioned before, there's been a massive employee culture shift of people, for instance, having to pivot and work from home and uh, the, uh, the ability to accept this change. Artificial intelligence for HR can also help promote and retain staff. I'll give you a really good example of myself <laughs> where this has happened to you and it took me completely by surprise. So um, last year, I was taking a, a very specialized program with an IBM for uh, they call it government uh, gold specialization. So I'm the only one in the country that's got this uh, government specialization. And so I was, it was weekends and nights and it was like a part-time job, it was insane. And at the end, I remember, um, you know, my, uh, you know, my, my, my vice president where I was talking to her and she's like, you know, was it worth it? Like, was it, I'm like, listen, I gained so much. I learned so much. Um, but what I didn't realize is that IBM's actually tracking me because as I was learning, I was having to enter that into the system. And then all of a sudden at the end of the year, and I had a great year, I, you know, a lot of success, what have you, um, I was uh, from, it came from the U S even come from the country. And it said, Melanie, you were just, uh, well, I was, I was recently promoted, whatever. And then they said, you know, we, uh, you've been identified and we're not going to share this because it's like that explainability. Right. But it, it was from the Watson AI arch HR system that we had in place that identified me as, you know, uh, being able to receive a bit of a compensation. And I was shocked. Our, my president was shocked. He's like, oh, like, not that shocked, not in a bad way. I'm not, I'm not a bad employee. But they were like, oh, we just didn't realize that this was even happening. Like no one told them. So it's not, oh, I have a great relationship with my boss. They think I'm doing a good job. They're going to give me a bonus. They're, the system was tracking me. And, and so it actually levels the playing field. It helps level the playing field with a lot of people. So um, internal chatbots can also assist with answering HR questions. Years of knowledge can be condensed to provide less experienced employees stemming brain drains from retirement and attrition, right? So you can, all those uh, massive manuals are with for um, uh, pr your production 
um, or, you know, medical or whatever, like so things that can take years and years, you can, you can actually just use that internally within a company and essentially give those tools to a brand new hire um, versus having all that knowledge leave the company when somebody retires. And then AI can also help with workforce scheduling, which we already talked about and can also assist in matching candidates to roles. We use it a lot for hiring and at not only just for IBM finding the right candidate, but for candidates that are um, looking to apply, to whether it's a really good match to ensure that the, 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 the role is right for them. And if they didn't know about them, they can make recommendations in terms of, have you considered given your profile, given your experience, these other roles, which maybe you didn't even know about. Um, I'm going to skip this because we're, we're, we're running out of time. I apologize. I get so passionate about this. Um, I will talk about this really quick supply chain. So as supply chains were completely disrupted during the pandemic, many organizations are now looking at uh, blending a just in time and spare capacity inventory. I thought this was really interesting because many organizations were using a just in time and they're actually moving away from just in time. Uh, they're moving more to a blended capacity model. Uh, so they're not caught off guard. And then uh, intelligent workflows can use real-time data to guide decision-making and improve outcomes. And um, yes, okay, I know we're at time. <laughs> um, and just in terms of the platforms, right? So many, as I mentioned before, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna end on the slide, but the, you know, many organizations before, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, the K-shaped model, right? So some of the biggest consumer tech platforms have steamed ahead, like Amazon. Um, like they had, they took up 70% of the stock market. Like their growth um, was incredible. Uh, its rise helped offset declines by more than half of other companies in the consumer sector. Or Apple, which is up 60% and is now bigger than the bottom third of companies in the S&P 500 combined, right? So the Amazons and the Apples of the world may be examples of successful solo players, but most businesses need a partnership strategy, right? So this is where the pandemic has really affected business models. Um, so, you know, within sectors, expectations of growing that broader reach will help redefine winners because it gives you a, comp you need a competitive advantage. So um, our data also points to greater reliance on platform business models and partner networks with 70% of executives planning significant partnering activity inside their industry and 57% looking outside. Either way, they expect participation to grow more than 300%, as you can see in this chart. Um, and I've seen this too. So the real opportunity, and this is what I was, I'm going to end on this, the real opportunity is that organizations and smaller companies, as they look to partner and create new business models and new platforms, they will have an opportunity to create new services. A great example of that is, um, I like to use trade lens as an example. So when Maersk first looked at blockchain, as, or sorry, when Maersk first looked at their, their, their supply chain and their business model and their process models, they realized that the cost of shipping a package of avocados from Kenya to Amsterdam the administrative cost was more expensive than the actual shipping cost. Like that's a problem. And so what they realized was this is a problem they couldn't solve by themselves. So that's when they started looking at um, a partnership model, growing that um, ecosystem. And then when they started partnering, all of a sudden you can start using, uh, applying new products and services to the market, right? And then creating a marketplace based off of that. So anyways, I'm gonna stop there. I know I'm a little bit over time, Margarita. I want to thank you for, for listening to me. Hopefully this was interesting and of value. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation because of course I could talk forever about this stuff. <laughs> thank you, Margarita. Super great. Thank you, Melanie. We have a, a huge participation today because there are 50 participants more or less. And uh, there are already some questions shared in a QA. and a uh, we can, uh, or if you want, you can read uh, this uh, question and answer. Otherwise, uh, we can uh, switch on the voice for the people who have uh, put yeah, this question. I can see now I'm out of my presentation, so I can just see. Yeah, the first question is from Ashish Kakar. Questions. Mobile business models normally have an associated transaction cost 
delivery costs in Amazon. Some countries like Singapore, as an example, are moving back to quasi normal. In this context, what AI use cases can help companies retain customers on digital models? Interesting. That is a great question. Um, Singapore, uh, Shisha is in Singapore. Eh? Is in Singapore? Oh, this is so yep. cool. <laughs> Incredible. It's early so, for me, but it's midday for a lot of other people. We have participants from over the world because we are in Canada, Shisha in Singapore. Super. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this is a very interesting question. Uh, what AI use cases can help companies retain customers on digital models? I would say, and I kind of skipped over this in my presentation, but it's that whole uh, client-centric model. So I think what the differentiation is with artificial intelligence is that companies that actually uh, use that and for mobile as well, and I know what you're saying, they're moving back because there's a reopening of the economy in certain areas, not everywhere. Um, it's that whole, maybe I can share my slide again. Uh, I, I know I skipped over it because I was running out of time. Um, give me 30 seconds, I'm gonna, share this if that's okay um share screen ah. okay hopefully you can see this okay so where are we so, you know, COVID has accelerated the digitization of customer interactions by several years as well. And so I think the opportunity here is that organizations that apply artificial intelligence for that forward facing, for that client experience, right? So being able to better understand that client centric, that citizen centric model where the client or your uh, client experience is key. So you are not just providing a product or a service that's completely um, standardized or commoditized. If you're just on the line and you are in a commodity business, it's very hard to compete. But if you can create an experience for your customers so that they feel like it's not just um, you know, a package of gum that they're buying or whatever, that there's an entire uh, experience around that, there, there's a community around that. Uh, successful brands that have applied um, you know, uh, consumer, for instance, online consumer uh, generated content and have an opportunity to uh, use AI to be able to also, you know, predict what your clients want and quickly pivot on what products you should be um, putting on your online site, right? So one of the conversations that I had that I was my best conversation, I loved it uh, in my class, the, the recent class that I just taught for m &E which was on uh, e-commerce and e-tailing, was how um, on a, in a digital uh, e-commerce scenario, um, organizations have to pivot really quickly in terms of their products that they're offering on their site because um, the, 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 the demand changes really quickly, right? And, and being able to quickly weed out the products that you may not be selling quite as well and having analytics to really understand what's selling well, what isn't selling well, who is your client? How am I addressing them? How am I creating an experience for that client? I hope, I hope that answers the question. I don't know, because they can't okay. talk back. <laughs> I'm going to assume that that's okay. Yeah. I don't know if, Margarita, if anyone else had anything to add yes, to that. Yes, uh, there are other questions. So there is uh, another yeah. question by anonymous attendee. How do you take a bias into the equation? What is done in this regard? And that's, and you know what, that is uh, absolutely critical. So, and when I was talking here, I'll, I'll stop sharing this now. Um, well, you know what, I can go back. When I, when I was talking about, where were we? When we were talking about the AI models here, what I think is really interesting is um, the actual models is usually where the bias happens, right? And so when you start looking at switching to a blended um, scenario analysis model, it can help. So obviously explainability is a huge, and I know that you, you I mean, there's gonna be entire sessions, I believe on ethics and bias, right? Within AI, I think you have, a, you have this a session on that as part of the series, we could talk for an hour on that, but the, the, the bias happens at the model level. So if you start to uh, look at you know, how can you improve that model that it's not necessarily based on 
past experience, but on scenarios, all of a sudden that maybe you could, um, make an effort to ensure that the scenarios that you were building for your artificial intelligence um, model actually takes bias into account, right? Or can have different scenarios that might affect the outcome. And I think actually helps take that bias out more so than if you were just to use um, historical data. Okay. And then what's the next question here? Ah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, uh, it's better to read them because not all uh, the participants can read the questions. Oh yeah. So, so how where are we? Oh, there was an there was a number and then I can't see them anymore. Okay, so the one that I have in front of me right now is I have a sales telecom IoT SaaS background with Verizon Business Group. For backgrounds like this seminar, what is a good way to get into a sales or strategic business development space in companies like IBM? Oh, that's a fantastic question. So, um if you have a strong, and you know what's interesting, I feel like the, and this is what I tell all my students, I find that people either have a really strong business background or, but don't understand the technology or don't take the time to understand the capabilities of the technology or the opportunities of the business value of the, uh, of the technology. Or you have very, very technical people who don't take the time to understand what the business impacts are or, or, or to really understand how to, um, to, to speak to business, right? If you have a strong combination of both, and it sounds like you do, because if you've got a sales and technical background, I think you're a fantastic candidate for, for this kind of work, because you really do need to have that, um, that, re that understanding of business, because technology for technology's sake is, is, is not going to go anywhere, right? But being able to understand the value of technology, what is going on in your business, applying it, to create value, which is this whole series, which I think is amazing, um, then I think you're in a you're in a great spot. And then somebody wrote, oh, for the AI ML blockchain space, I think it applies. I think what I just said uh, absolutely applies. Perfect. We have another question by Clément Terrien. Okay, so it says thank, thank you, you very, very much. Oh, go ahead, Margarita. No, no, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, you focused on how COVID nineteen crisis forced companies and organization to change their models. Because I'm certain that digital transformation has been slowed down because of older generation way of consuming. I mean, in particular in administration, they have to keep traditional organization to match the expectations of everyone. Here, can we assume the fact that some people in this category will be forced to discover? Oh, <laughs> so he's a, I think it's he continues. stopped. Is this, sorry, uh, not, sorry, enough not enough space <laughs> to finish the question. Please, uh, Clement, if you can. Yeah, we're, uh, we're waiting. We're waiting for your, your question. Yeah, let's see. Maybe I can uh, enable Clement to talk. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. Clement, uh, Clement, you can talk. But I think you're on mute. Clement, you are mute. Switch on the, the micro and you can put uh, your yes. question. Can uh, you great. hear me? Yes, yes, hello. Uh, sorry, because I hadn't uh, enough space to, to write uh, the entire question. But uh, yeah, the, the end of the question is, uh, can people uh, will be forced to change their consuming uh, habits? You know what I mean? Because of this crisis. Yeah, so we didn't talk about, this is a really interesting point because we did not talk about um, the, cons I talk more about the business aspect, not so much about the other end, which is the yeah, consumers, course. right? You're absolutely right. So in terms of consumer, um, the consumption of that business, right? The consumption of the products or goods or services, um, you're absolutely right. Like it, there was a huge impact. And I like how you mentioned that it, it, it affects different generations differently, right? So when we talk about mobile, uh, when I was talking, the, the one slide that I did talk a little bit was on that mobile slide in terms of mobile adoption through the pandemic. Um, I don't have a lot of data on that in terms of how people are going to consume, but I, I do feel that obviously because of the lockdown, because everyone has, and it again, different countries is different. Like if I look at the United States, there's barely a lockdown down there versus here. It's, it's, we are super locked down. Like I haven't really been anywhere in a long time. So um, it, it depends on where you live, what generation you're from, what access you have to technology. And, um, and you're right. Like, in just in terms of the ability to change and adapt, right. To be able to uh, consume those products. And I think you're right. I think that the older generation, um, you know, 
may be struggling. They're taught, and there, I have heard of reports of, uh, old, you know, older generation, um, you know, feeling loneliness because they're disconnected from family and they ne don't necessarily are comfortable with technology um, and, and have challenges in, 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 uh, in, in, in adopting and, and changing quickly. So I, I think you're, you're, you're right there. Great. So we have a, okay, when well, anonymous attendees say, please hire me. <laughs> Good. <laughs> then we have Anna Regina. So maybe Anna Regina, I can allow you to talk. Let's see. Okay, Anna Regina, if you wanted to put your question directly. Yeah, hello, my name is Anna Regina. So um, I've worked uh, in, a, in a big company, in a big travel company, and we were trying to find a solution to have a really good chatbot, actually people making people not uh, be annoyed by it because it's answering badly or not incorrectly. But on the mm -hmm. other side, uh, Salma will know much more about it as she's doing her PhD about it. But um, also not having it too, uh, too human, which makes it also weird for the person using the chatbot or chatting with the chatbot. So I wanted to ask how uh, you managed this uh, at, at Canada Post to have a really like good and accurate chatbot because even the biggest companies are still struggling so much nowadays with uh, having a really good solution. That's a fantastic question. So part of it is the scope, right? So we have to define the scope of what you're actually trying to do. So the, the chatbot's not trying to completely replace an agent. It's kind of like that first level. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, 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 and it, the, the reason it was so successful is that it was able to do a few things really well, which is one, um, answer basic questions, right. That would normally take some time to actually find, uh, being able to track a package as an example, or give, um, you know, basic information about the whereabouts of, of their, you know, their package. Right. Um, so really it was a scope or you're not trying to solve everything. Mm -hmm. If you start with a small scope mm -hmm. and then you, uh, we still have the back center agent. So it's kind of level one, level two support. So level one support is the agent level two support at a certain, uh, if the, if the answers are getting too complicated or not able to answer, they would then transfer to an agent, right? Um, even just that basic, basic model saved them huge amounts of work and, and, and money because um, even if it's a, a relatively smaller scope, you're not, again, again, you're not a deploying uh, AI for answering all the questions that a, an agent would, would typically have. You're just answering the, the, the first level. And so by doing that, and, and, and I know what you're saying, like when they, when, um, how do you ensure that they're not, um, annoyed, right? So there was a mechanism in the in 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 the chatbot that would allow um, a, an easy transition from mm -hmm. the chatbot to an agent, so that you don't lose that individual throughout that session, and yep. Um, yep. yeah, and just the scope. But even if it's small, it has a huge impact on the business because it's yep. pennies versus dollars, and you're able to to spin people up within um, hours versus months, right? Yeah. So what happened uh, from my experience was that people were complaining more about the chatbot than oh, the chatbot. really yeah, yeah and it depends on how you train it right exactly. so a lot and of it unfortunately it is yeah like you it, said it, it needs to be simple in the first like step it has to be simple and you have to have a really good team that is willing to spend like i said before 80 percent is in the de data cleansing and it's setting it up and mm -hmm. so in training and really training the chatbot so it took us like a long time to train it a long time it took us a few weeks a few weeks right but once it was trained um and the scope was defined it, it was very successful thank you very much yeah you're welcome Super. we have uh, also rupesh okay. now rupesh i can uh, okay you can talk okay um as you mentioned an ai was following your performance yeah <laughs> do you think in the future employee performance will be monitored? Yeah. Well, yeah. And you know what? If you can add some. Uh... Yes, by using uh, AI. Thank for you very much. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Melanie, for answering uh, and having a wonderful presentation. Yeah, as, well as, as I was saying about the AI for leadership, would you consider like 
would it be any bias in the system? Because as you know, organization can have their own biases and can make sure that somebody is performing always well and somebody isn't. And I don't know how there is going to be a measure or. Yeah. You know be- what though? Here's, here's what I, th- I think there's already a lot of bias. Like yeah. people have bias, right? So without AI, I would say that um, in the organizations, it's, you know, it's a lot of relationships, uh, how you, how you work and, and, and so forth. Um, what I found interesting is that y- yes, there could be bias, but I think what they were doing is they were more tracking. So we have this, I have to say, there's a lot of things that the company doesn't do well, but there's a, one thing it does very well is um, the training, the training programs that we have. There's a real big push on um, a growth mindset. And so um, there's this badge program. And so what it was, it was really just training, you know, uh, it was taking a number of things into account. And I don't think anything is biased. It's just you know, uh, in my, um, my manager's evaluations, did I do it well? And I did, uh, in my, uh, my metrics, did I attain all my metrics? Yes. Did, uh, and then on top of that, it's like, okay, so how many courses did I take? This is very quantitative, right? How many courses did I take? Um, how many, uh, hours did I put in to self-learning? And I didn't think it was going to go anywhere, right? For me, it was just like, oh, this is just for myself and to, to be better at what I do. But it was being tracked. So, um, and they take a number of factors, right? But you're all, you have, listen, bias is going to be in the model that they use. I don't even know what the model they used. I was just the recipient of it. But um, I think it actually will help level the playing field, especially now that people are working from home. They're not in an office setting. There's maybe less opportunity to uh, highlight some of the great things that you're doing, right? Because everyone's remote. So yeah. this is a way maybe to also uh, ensure that if you're doing the right things, you can still shine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. And uh, we have also a suggestion by Imen Benoit. Oh, yes. The, yeah. So sorry, it's in French. Je parle français, il n'y a pas de problème. <laughs> you can find the yearly study of the digital habits in France. Oh, fantastic. Of course, not included COVID crisis impact. Yeah, but I, I will absolutely look at that. That looks interesting. Thank you for sharing that. This is yeah. oh, Benoit. No, yeah, not in men. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, Pierre says, first, thank you. Pierre, I, let's see. So we have a live question. Pierre, you can talk. Ah, okay. Oh, hi. Hello. Uh, so first of all, very thank you for this presentation. That was quite advanced, actually, uh, but very interesting. I was very curious, like, seeing how AI and these disruptive technologies can really have, like, Today, laboratory uh, to help to find solutions for uh, tests and the vaccine, maybe. Yeah, I'm trying to find. I have a backup slide here. Just a second. I think this might be of interest. Just a second, if I can find it. I was gonna present it, but I'm like, I already have too many slides. Uh, <laughs> oh, where did I put it? Here we go. Okay. So this is an interesting slide in terms of AI applied to the pandemic itself. Um, and what organizations were um, actually able to predict. So there's a company called Blue Dot that predicted the pandemic even before it hit. So uh, they had they used early detection anomalies uh, and something called the digital smoke signals, right? So they were able to predict it uh, days in advance, or we, I can't remember exactly, I think it was weeks in advance, but they used, um, um, different kinds of models do that. There's also prediction. So in detection, diagnosis, like diagnosis, um, accelerating research is being used. So AI, there's a huge amount of information on how AI is actually, um, like if you just go and Google online, you're gonna find a ton of information. And that's why I was trying to weed that out because I'm like, well, I'll focus on the business. That's what I know anyways, but the uh, how AI uh, can help research, um, detection, prevention, um, and the recovery, right? So it, it, it's able, it depends again on the models that are created, but you know, there are models that are, that are used to uh, calculate a person's probability of infection, a monitor and track contagion in real time, uh, personalized news and content moderation. These are all the, in the prevention. So I, I, I almost used the slide. I almost thought it would be interesting, um, uh, you know, in terms of you know, how it can help find the vaccine. Absolutely. I think artificial intelligence, uh, I think out of all of the different technologies that we're talking about, I'd say uh, AI probably has the most promise in helping 
um, in actually discovering a vaccine. The blockchain is more around supply chain and uh, like identity and that sort of thing. I'd say AI probably has the most uh, the most promise. Anyhow, this I thought this was a very this is from the OECD. I thought this was a very interesting um, analysis in terms of how AI is applied to the pandemic, and then it could potentially help find a vaccine. So I hope that Gaeta, answers the question. Yes, you answered the question. So thanks, uh, Melanie. I have a final question. I see that there are no other questions in the Q&A. Uh, you mentioned before that the partners, to find partners, uh, in particular for platform, is one of the key issues, uh, in particular in the pandemic. Uh, are there stu uh, studies or uh, research that prove this? Uh, I mention this because we have a research project uh, inside the okay. research center. It's now in the publication uh, in MS Quarterly, where we measured uh, all the platforms uh, and the, the partner, uh, the partnership that they developed uh, mm -hmm. uh, during the past five years, so before the pandemic crisis. Okay. Uh, and it is totally true. So we try to interpret the theory, uh, the strategy that there is behind that is interesting. Uh, partnership, but you okay. mentioned that uh, with the pandemic, uh, this phenomenon is stronger, in particular for the platforms, yes. I assume. Yeah, I mean, what I saw, now I don't have any research paper on that, but what I did see in terms of what I what I, I was reading and what I've experienced too, just within my business, is that, um, as I mentioned before, like you, there, there are some really large platform vendors, like there's the Amazons and the Apples and what have you, but most organizations, if they're going to uh, survive, they need to be able to find their competitive differentiator. Because if you're going to go after a commoditized area, you're, it's very difficult, right? Like the margins are low. You have to have massive volumes. This is why Amazon example, it's just massive, massive volumes, right? To be able to, to be, um, uh, to have to, to be co competitive in that space. So in order to compete, there's a number of things, right? One, is to identify the right business partners and sometimes competitors mm -hmm. within an ecosystem. So there's three, I would say there's three um, types of um, industry. So, so there's the, uh, what would I call it? There's the industry platform, which is like, there's the internal platform. So if you look at internally within your organization, what are you, what is your current platforms that you have internally that run your business, right? Then there is the industry platforms. Mm -hmm. So who within my industry can I partner with to be more competitive, right? So those are the partners. Sometimes it's competitors as well. And that's where blockchain comes in because it allows you to uh, gain value by partnering with both competitors and um, uh, partners without divulging key business information that might uh, give away your business to your competitor, but you can get value by, by potentially um, partnering. And then lastly, it's cross industry. Mm -hmm. So this is the very interesting piece that I find, which is companies that are looking beyond their own industry to create new business value, exactly. right? And to create new services and new types of offerings to clients that they would never be able to do on their own. Mm -hmm. This is where I think the economy is going. That's where the real opportunity is lying, right? Which is, I have an organization, I'm partnering with somebody completely outside of my, my industry, and all of a sudden, I am creating a differentiated solution mm -hmm. that no one else can provide, and that provides a huge competitive differentiator against the large commoditized platform vendors. And this is related to the emergence of business ecosystem because we are no more exactly. talking about networking or there is still networking, but now in the AI enabled uh, environments, uh, we have a business ecosystem where the platforms uh, uh, partner with different companies from uh, also other industries. Uh, yeah. and, and I'm seeing that with government, right? Because government as well, like when I talk to them about this platform economy, um, they play a role too. Right. So, for instance, um, great example is in like the food production. Right. So you've got farmers, you've got manufacturers, you've got suppliers, you have everything. And then government can play pretend, potentially like a certification role or they can help um, uh, monitor and uh, that that. Um, and provide certifications for 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 that industry. I mean, they're still sort of related, but, you know, it's that opportunity to start creating new value propositions with, you know, industries that never, you know what, I have one, a really good one, a good slide here, just a second. 
I, I, I apologize. I ran out of time. I thought I was, I thought I was going to, I didn't have enough time. Here's, here's um, really quickly. Okay, maximum time is 1.30. So we are, oh, okay. the, yeah, now we, we are only had 45 minutes. So I, here, I'll show you what I, I mean here. So these are, these are organizations that have adopted a platform approach, right? So um, yeah, before here, I'll go, I'll go up, like, if you don't mind, we, we stopped here, but you know, I, I wanted to talk about the platforms have become a major source of business growth and innovation. So the market value of the four of the top five companies is from the IBV study again, uh, it was 4.3 trillion, uh, seven out of the 10 most innovative companies globally possess platform centric business models. Right. And so what are some of the key things that are uh, required for a business platform? So deep expertise. So if you've got really deep uh, uh, industry expertise that provides an advantage. And then again, if you can partner with some another um, industry that has this kind of expertise and combine it, obviously you've got something new. Right. Uh, differentiated workflows, um, exponential technology applications, which is like AI, blockchain, IoT, um, unique proprietary data. Right. If you've got data that no one else has, that's a competitive advantage. Uh, scale, the ability to scale. Right. And you can't often can't do that on your own. Um, channel power, which is that network. Right. And network credibility as well. Uh, there's some examples that I had here um, of some uh, platform uh, providers where I know, like, for instance, um, like uh, Starbucks. Uh, has partnered with payment systems, a retail, like if you go into their store, they, they I mean, you've got music. I mean, you know, I'm not, haven't been to Starbucks in a long time, but there, there, there's like the, for instance, um, you know, they partner with artists and music to create more of a platform, right? Um, Volkswagen has like an apps within their, um, the platform also for travel and utilities, they have a retail function now. So they're even healthcare and wellness, like they've branched out, not just focus on the automotive industry, but they're actually branching out as a platform. Mm -hmm. um, CVS, same thing. They're actually really connected with uh, health insurance, right? So CVS is a large pharmaceutical company in, or sorry, not pharmaceutical. They're like a pharmacy, sorry, in the United States. And, um, but they have, uh, partnered with like fitness providers, mm -hmm. with education, health and insurance, like I said, um, healthcare providers. Um, and then, you know, the, anyhow, these are just a few, these are a few examples, right? Uh, Rakuten with retail and travel and financial services and, mm -hmm. and same thing. There's, a, there's a number of examples, but yeah, so this is, this is where uh, the industry is going. So I, I would love actually, Margaret, if you don't mind, I would love to read your, your of research course. at yeah, one yeah, point. Yeah. I, this is something that I'm very, very passionate about because I see it uh, on a daily basis with my clients and we're, we're working with them today, trying to um, help them be ready for the shift. Right. And this uh, for the, within the, uh, like this, the economy. For sure. So I will send this to you. Fantastic. I'm glad Great. that you're working on that. So thank you very much, Melanie. I think uh, we have we are now in time to close uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks to all the participants uh, for joining and participating also with the Q&A. And um, so thanks, uh, Melanie. And uh, I remind that uh, the next uh, event uh, is uh, on December 3, because there is uh, um, an event uh, webinar organized inside Dame Leon that involves uh, our research center. So, thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.